So welcome everyone to the second panel of the eighth Frankfurt Conference on Financial Market Policy. My name is Tobias Trüger and I'm the director of the cluster law and finance at SAFE. Following the general theme of this year's conference, today's panel will focus specifically on banks, the impact of the pandemic on the sector. And our distinct panel will start out with a broader macro perspective, which is interesting because when I published the first policy intervention with my co-authors back in June, we argued already for a large-scale recapitalization of the European banking sector. Yet the conventional wisdom at the time seemed to be that the government responses focusing on the support of corporates and small entrepreneurs would spare banks from losses. Now that the second wave is rolling across Europe, the prospects seem much bleaker. And we're lucky that such a distinguished expert like Rolf Strauch, the chief economist at the European Stability Mechanism, will shed some light on this critical question. And if banks indeed do incur losses, can they withstand them? And not only that, will they also be able to support the recovery after the crisis? And how likely is it that some banks will indeed reach the point of non-viability? Also here, we're blessed to receive some high quality input from a most competent person, Kerstin af who is a member of the supervisory board of the single supervisory mechanism at the European Central Bank. And should we indeed see banks failing, effective resolution becomes pivotal. In the European context, of course, this begs the question if the European resolution framework is fit for purpose. In particular, if two significant banks get into difficulties at the same time, can the SRM cope? Once again, we can look forward to high level insights from within the key player presented by Jan Reinder de Carpentier, the vice chair of the single resolution board presenting us his views. And depending on the severity uh, of the crisis, the question also arises whether Europe might need a common backstop and how it should be designed. And it, uh, it will be again Rolf, uh, Rolf Schlauch's turn to enlighten us on also this aspect, uh, not least because he's affiliated with an institution that certainly would qualify for the job. Um, both Thomas Huertas, who is now a senior fellow at the Safe Policy Center and our co-host today, and I myself have argued in the Safe White Papers for further measures to recapitalize the banking system. We largely agree and where we diverge, Thomas, the learning, but in any case, the audience uh, will have also the opportunity to learn about these two positions. And it's quite importantly that our friendly and most respectful res controversy is just very typical for Safe. Because unlike other think tanks, we do not want to cram down uh, something like a partisan presidential view and decision makers, but rather we want to engage in a joint effort where we find solutions that benefit society and in an evidence-based dialogue with policymakers and regulators. And to make that actually happen today, I turn immediately over today to today's co-host, Tom Huertas, and the other panelists. Tom. I, I suggest we, we go ahead with the first uh, uh, contribution. All right, so uh, then it's Rolf's turn to tell us a little bit about the macro scenario. Thank you very much, Tobias. Happy to do so. Let me say a few words on where I think that we stand in terms of economics and then how I see the implications for the corporate sector, for the household sector, and, and correspondingly for the banks. Now, on the economy, um, we have this year is marked by the deepest recession for 100 years. And um, <clears throat> that, that's notable. And obviously, it, it shapes the overall uh, way we can look at the situation. At the same time, we have to be mindful of the profile of this recession and the particular nature of the pandemic. So we had this lockdown in spring. Afterwards, some recovery. Now, as you mentioned before, we're going through a second wave, which means also economically due to the partial lockdown that we are experiencing means um, um, a second dip. The expectation is that that second dip will be much less severe than the first one due to changes in behavioral pattern and due to changes in policies. But nonetheless, forward-looking, there are kind of two prevailing forces that we have to take into account. So one is that on the downside, there is this question, how much 
how deep are the scars that this recession has left in the economy. And that relates to very many different dimensions of economic losses that agents, that households, that workers, um, that companies have incurred. And here could be a more protected impact on, on the economy. The other side is that obviously with the news being forthcoming on the vaccines and the possibility to get across, there's also an upside scenario. And the upside, it is clear that the kind of, if you wish, technical knowledge, common wisdom that is now portrayed is that vaccines will not be available on a massive scale in the first half of next year, or that one can expect more broad-based vaccination maybe by the end of next year. But from an economic perspective, we should also be mindful that there are network effects, there are benchmark effects, so not everyone needs to be needs to receive a vaccine and their anticipation effects. And those anticipation effects we already see in financial markets. And they mean that basically by having a positive outlook, then um, you can avoid some savings behavior, precautionary saving. So from that perspective, I agree with you that the situation is risky as you portrayed it at the start. And we should be very mindful of the risks. The risks are also that the economic effect will be uneven across countries and uneven across sectors, uneven across different sections of the population. But at the same time, there's also, um, uh, so to speak, a hopeful aspect that is already foreshadowing to now. So this is the overall situation of how I look at it. Now then the question is, what was with the government response and is the government response enough in order to address that situation? So here, one point on the government response. The government response was massive, both at the national and the European level. And we should also be clear that Europe stands out globally by having, having given a great deal of support and emphasis in supporting the corporate sector and supporting the banks in lending. So the guarantee schemes that European governments came up with amount to more than 20% of GDP and they're the bulk of the measures. So massive backing that was so far partly taken up and I'm sure that um, also our, our colleagues can say, say more about it or others on the panel. It was partly taken up in Germany so far limited, so there's still a lot of space to go in case there were need. In other countries, the take up uh, was somewhat higher, but overall there is some space. The second element is that the banks were essential in the reaction to the crisis. So that we haven't seen a deeper recession it has a lot to do with the measures putting in place by the government with the ability of the banks to react. And that was obviously also the consequence of many measures that were taken before that this time could make the banks more of a solution than of a problem than uh, compared to the last crisis. Now, what can we expect forward looking? Um, and here again, we can go more into the details and EBA has yesterday also, or has this week um, published a report on the role of regulatory measures on moratoria of payment. So the overall take so far is in terms of insolvencies and non-performing loans, but let me stick to the general aspect here of corporate insolvencies. We haven't seen, so to speak, the bottom of the barrel yet. That has to do because the impact may be unfolding over time and it has to do with the regulatory and other measures being taken. So from my perspective, it is clear that we will see more consequences of the crisis in the corporate sector that will also have repercussions for the risks that banks take on their balance sheet. The IMF has estimated in, in the documents that they published for the last annual meetings that insolvencies could basically double 
um, under, under some scenarios, so which is significant. But again, we also have to see it against the further economic outlook, how that will be playing out. And we have to see it against the amount of public guarantees provided. So from that perspective, there are risks that are there, but my impression is not that this is in any case an unmanageable situation. We will face higher risks um, unavoidably, but within a manageable scope uh, from an overall economic perspective. Just a final few remarks on what I think, what it, what it means. So what is clear is that this situation hits a strengthened banking sector, but a banking sector also that still has some inherited problems in terms, for example, of low profitability. And we see that also in share prices, um, how the market is looking at the banking sector. Here, my point is very simple and I make it very short is that our experience from the past crisis is it's always good to address banking problems upfront rather than running behind and try to address them comprehensively. So from that perspective, and I conclude on that, I just would say there is a great deal to be said in completing banking union now, and the efforts should be strengthened. ESM is part of that picture, and I think it would be good, and it is good that we can advance on that agenda. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for this insight. Um, I wanted to uh, give the panelists an immediate uh, opportunity to react to what Wolf said beyond their statements, which are to follow. Or if you feel the need to, to somehow comment on what Wolf said, you can do that now. And for the audience, you can use um, at the end of the, this, this session, the Q&A function of Zoom in order to pose your questions and then the panelists will take that up. But uh, for the time being, if, uh, no one of the panelists currently wants to comment on what Wolf said, I would turn over to Kirsten just to give a more granular perspective on what is to be expected on the bank, uh, with, for the banking sector. Kirsten. Thank you, Tobias, and uh, thanks for the good questions. And I mean, I agree very much with what uh, Rolf uh, uh, said and his analysis on the present situation. I mean, we are under a great uncertainty still. And uh, uh, from our, from the supervisory perspective, we are, I mean, concerned about potential cliff effects uh, uh, ultimately affecting banks when the uh, government guarantees and moratoriums will expire. So this is an important issue for us to uh, closely follow uh, banks uh, uh, and how they are dealing with their credit risk and also making sure that they have a good capital planning for the future. So I would like to uh, highlight three aspects on the uh, questions you posed to me and the first aspect concerns credit risk management uh, by banks. I mean, back in July, the ECB carried out an analysis of the potential vulnerabilities of our banking se sector under different scenarios. And the conclusion was that under a central scenario envisaging a very harsh recession uh, with Euro area GDP uh, falling by 8.7% in 2020, followed by a fairly robust recovery in 21-22, the banking sector would be able to withstand the effects of the shock on its asset quality and capital. In a less likely scenario with a sharper recession followed by a more sluggish recovery, the deterioration of asset quality and the capital depletion could be significantly more material. This analysis was carried out when most countries in Europe were exiting the first wave of the pandemic. We are now going through a, another difficult phase of the crisis with more infections and uh, related public interventions increasing. But at the same time, I think there are also more uh, positive signals now on the vaccine and how the, uh, our economies will be able to recover. So there are uh, different, uh, it, the situation is rather difficult to, uh, to really assess and what will be the effect on banks' uh, balance sheet. 
At uh, this juncture, our main priority is to ensure that banks are well prepared to manage the impact of the crisis and especially that they become proactive in managing the upcoming deterioration in asset quality. Banks need to make sure that they have the operational capacity to effectively manage the increase in distressed or defaulted exposures. And similarly, they should ensure adequate levels of provisioning for their loan books. And by acting in a timely manner, banks can thus minimize any potential cliff effects when the moratoria and other governmental support measures begin to expire. The second aspect concerns loss absorption by banks. In the new Basel framework developed after the great financial crisis, banks have been required to build capital and liquidity buffers, including for the purpose of helping to withstand a significant adverse shock. The partial or full use of those buffers during a sharp downturn is essential to prevent procyclical behavior by the banking sector. The relief package the ECB banking supervision announced in March was designed in line with the Basel framework to ensure that banks would be able to keep lending to the economy, even through very harsh economic conditions, and while at the same time mitigating pro-cyclicality. The measures in the package included granting some relief in the composition of Pillar 2 requirement and allowing, allowing banks to temporarily operate below their required level of capital and liquidity. We gave some forward guidance to banks as regards the expected timeline on buffer replenishment so as to reduce any stigma associated with banks' potential use of buffers. And in order to support banks' loss absorption capacity and their ability to keep lending to the real economy, we also recommended banks on a temporary and a very exceptional manner to not distribute dividends or engage in uh, share buybacks uh, in order to, uh, to keep capital resources in the system. However, in spite of the flexibility granted by supervisors, many banks have not yet used their buffers and we have, not, uh, we have to understand better why this is the case. I mean, one uh, uh, reason is probably that they didn't need to use their buffers, but we think also that there may be a financial market pressure creating incentives for banks to behave in the opposite direction of what we as supervisors have intended, because lower uh, capitalization levels can be associated with higher funding costs or lower market valuations for banks. Another reason may have to do with banks' incentives in the capital stacking as it's currently designed, because any breach of the combined buffer requirement will be associated with restrictions on dividend distributions. So banks may be seeking to stay clear of their threshold as part of their preparations for when our recommendation is lifted. The fact that the additional T1, the 81 capital instruments do not seem to be working to absorb capital losses on a going concern basis as they were originally intended to may be an additional factor for banks not to dip into their combined buffer requirements because banks may be concerned that skipping a coupon payment on such instruments would be interpreted by markets as an early indication of solvency problems to come further down the road. The third aspect I would like to mention relates to the challenges to the banking business brought about by the pandemic. I mentioned earlier that credit risk management will pose a challenge in the near term. Looking further ahead in a medium term perspective, the COVID-19 shock is likely to exacerbate the need for banks to adapt their business models to the new realities of the banking business in the low interest environment, including those related to low profitability and the need to invest in digitalization. So we, here we see consolidation as one way to help banks deal with this dual challenge ahead. 
uh, while also addressing the excess capacity which still exists in parts of the banking system. And for those banks that are unsuccessful in their effort to adapt and succeed in the new banking normal, it is important to have a robust framework in place so that we can they can also exit the market in an orderly fashion and with minimal uh, disruption. And I think with this end, I can also um, have a handover also to the discussion on the uh, single resolution board and uh, the uh, resolution authorities uh, mandate. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Kirsten, for these insights. Um, I think uh, one aspect that, that is critical that you pointed out is really that, that the uh, return to, to pre-crisis lending levels occurs in this very dynamic, probably also historically exceptionally dynamic environment where we see a transformation, disintermediation, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that certainly plays a role. Um, it also puts in another layer of stress, if you so want, on the system, despite the fact that particularly for smaller and medium-sized firms, banks are still uh, the most important uh, source of funding. And therefore, for the recovery, given the structure of the European economy, this is critical. But once again, I think, um, let me just uh, give the other panelists an opportunity to react to something that, that uh, Kerstin uh, mentioned, comments, and if you don't feel the need. So I indeed turn over to Jan to uh, share some insights from the SRB on, on how, how we're, we'll be dealing. Although the first two interventions somehow suggest your role won't be that significant, but uh, maybe you have a different view. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to join this, this conference uh, on, this, on this very important and interesting topic. So let me lead, like, let's try to and explain a couple of things more from a, from a resolution authority perspective. But first of all, I would like to say that I very much agree with what Rolf and, and Kirsten already have, have said. Um, as, as to your question, uh, to me, basically, is the European resolution framework robust enough and, and fit for purpose? Personally, I think that the real question is whether or not we still believe that losses should be borne by shareholders and, and creditors first and not by the taxpayer. Certainly, I believe that we must protect the taxpayer. And so therefore the framework is fit for purpose. Even if we still have to put in place some missing pieces, as was already said by, by Rolf as well, such as the third pillar of the banking union, so the EDIS, harmonization of the insolvency framework and developing further the capital market, market union. In addition, the 2013 banking communication of the commission needs to be aligned to the BRD and SRMR to avoid misaligned incentives. The current framework is robust and yet allows for some flexibility. For example, we were able to balance on the one hand, the need to provide relief to banks to face the current economic challenges, but also the need to make progress on the requirements to become resolvable, which is more important than ever. On the operational side, we postponed less urgent information or data requests in line with the recommendations of the EBA. Banks managed to respect the limited extension of the deadlines and therefore our 2020 resolution planning cycle remains well on track. Banks also have a clear roadmap from now with the SRB's expectations for banks. You can find this on our website and the new AMRO requirements to be implemented between now and 23. Nevertheless, there are certain important elements in the framework we cannot deviate from. Just to give you an example, it was not possible to defer contributions to the single resolution fund this year. This would not have been a good idea for several reasons. One, it would mean banks are hit much harder in 21, which now looks to be at least as challenging as this year. Secondly, it is in turbulent times that we must focus on the strengthening of the resolution tools. Thirdly, the regulation does not offer the flexibility in this respect. Only a change in legislation allowing for an extension of the overall deadline for reaching the target level of the SRF would have had a meaningful impact on banks' 2020 capital ratios without risking to overburden banks going forward. In short, we have a framework and now more than ever, the SRB is doing its part to ensure it is ready for action should a bank fall into difficulty. That being said, like with most things in life, there is always room for improvement. 
But I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. We can build on what we already have, which is a robust framework for resolution. It's often been said during this crisis that banks are part of the solution, not the problem. This can be true, but only if banks ensure they continue to do things like building up sufficient MREL and ensure they have adequate provisioning for possible or likely NPLs down the track. Although it's not for the SRB to prescribe business models, it is important that banks pay attention to non-viable loans to avoid ending up being non-viable themselves. And like Kirsten also said, proper risk management needs to be in place. The action from the current situation is going to be a source of debate. When do we roll back public support? When can we fully reopen the economy? When do we say that the business is no longer viable? I think it was relatively easy to implement emergency measures back in spring, but it will be more difficult to exit them properly and at the right moment. Perhaps a word on public funds, state aid, injections of cash, call it what you will. We cannot forget the reasons why the resolution framework was created in the first place, to make sure that banks themselves become more responsible for their actions. It must continue to be the case that where losses have to be attributed, it is clear who is first in line to take those losses, equity and bondholders. So banks management should be responsible and prudent in their behavior in order to try and ensure those who have invested in banks do not suffer losses. What cannot happen is that we return to the situation of publicly funded bailouts, that day is gone. We will continue to work with all our partners, including the SSM, to ensure that we promote financial stability in the banking union, while, like I said, protecting the taxpayer. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Um, very clear statement um, on, on where you think we stand, um, which makes it all the more difficult to, to ask the next question because you're, so essentially the, the gist of uh, all the three interventions so far is yeah, that well, um, in the long run or even in the medium term, uh, the institutional framework is fine and, and uh, the key players are all very well aware of the risks and therefore can cope with the situation. However, if that is not the case, then uh, maybe we need a backstop. I don't know, what, what's your view on that? Because I mean, obviously your institution has been uh, put into the discussion as a potential backstop, at least to the SRF, maybe, maybe even larger. Uh, th thank you very much, Tobias. I'm happy to reply to this and maybe also take up the question that was posed in, in the chat for me uh, regarding the upfront response that I, um, that I alluded to. Um, so to put it a bit into perspective, yes, the situation looks relatively good and firm, certainly much, much better than it did in the past crisis. But nobody has said that there are no risks, right? Um, I think Kerstin alluded to the high degree of uncertainty and also my reading of the, what you did in the last exercise in July is that while it looks good overall, it doesn't say that each and every single institution <laughs> at each and every moment in time under all circumstances is able to survive uh, the, the crisis with no damage, right? So there are risks uh, there that one, one cannot neglect. And it's the point of being prepared for that. And that was what I wanted to say in terms of trying to address this upfront in creating the framework. I do fully agree with what Jan said, is that we have put a good framework in place and we need to work on it. And that already puts us in a much better situation also again as, as uh, during the, the great financial crisis or the, the European debt crisis. That doesn't mean that there is no scope for working on it and improving it. There are ongoing discussions on how to do that, for example, on how to make the crisis management system more perfect, how to address medium-sized, the problem of medium-sized banks. And for example, also with the proposal that was made by Andrea and Ria in thinking about AMCs. And when I said that one should address, look at the situation comprehensively upfront, this is what I meant, having this kind of preparedness. I did not want to say that now we need to massively step in with additional precautionary capitalization of banks. Um, but rather, the point is, improve the framework and 
uh, to be able to react to the risks um, upfront in, in a comprehensive way. Next to issues like AMCs, this entails banking union. This entails kind of making the, getting more robustness there. And if we look at banking union, they have been the first two pillars set up, which is the supervision and the resolution. So we know that the third pillar is the one where it is still a bit of a construction site and on which we need to work. Here, one element is the common backstop to the single resolution fund. The other one that will take longer in order to implement is the common deposit insurance scheme. Now, for the common backstop, it is decided and agreed that the ESM should have that role. And this is a, dis a point on, that will be discussed also when this can be launched, will be discussed uh, forward-looking in the Eurogroup, um, whether this, when this process can be started, which is linked to an ESM treaty ratification. What is very important in understanding the, the backstop is um, that it really fits also fully into what Jan said about not making the taxpayers pay for it. So that we are there to cover costs from resolution if they cannot be covered by the single resolution fund by way of extending a loan to the fund. But eventually the costs will be recovered from the banking industry over time. So from that perspective, it's fiscally neutral. And we have also to see that it is meant to not happen very often, right? This should be, and what experience tells, this would be only in extreme circumstances. Nonetheless, and that is an important element in order to give robustness to the system, it's good to be prepared. And it's good to know that this backstop is there. And it's also good to know that it's one of the elements that breaks the sovereign bank doom loop. So from the, all those perspectives, I think it's part of the preparedness is to take the decision now, launch the process, and, and then uh, on that account, give more robustness as we go through the process of learning about the full repercussions of the crisis. And I would leave it at that for the moment. Okay, um, thank you. So, so one recurring theme, I think, for, uh, among all the panelists is a very strong belief that the resolution framework is also apt to deal with systemic crises. And um, I just want to highlight one point, even if that's the case, because that's probably debatable. But if it's the case, um, there is also, of course, something that, that Kirsten and, and Roy both mentioned that, of course, we will see a asymmetric effect of the crisis across countries. And if you use now broad resolution powers, this may wipe out the banking sector in certain economies. Um, and I mean, that's, of course, an oversimplification of the problem, but it looks like um, this might also be a problem. I don't know if you have any reactions. Um, to that geographic dimension, if you use uh, indeed broadly resolution powers, I don't know, Jan, if you if the SRM, uh, the SRB is somehow discussing this, or if you don't see this danger. Well, I, I think, like Kirsten said, I think one one thing for sure is that that you know that that this crisis has a certain unprecedented form, and I think it's also difficult to predict exactly what, what will happen, how things will, will, will unfold. So, so also I don't have this crystal ball on my, on my desk telling me exactly what will happen when. I think, uh, as, as has been explained, I think it's very important that we continue monitoring the situation closely, that we work well together, but at the same time, like Rolf also explained, you know, that, that we keep on building the, um, the, 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 the safeguards in, in, the, in the banking union and, uh, and there the backstop is important, the EDIS is important, uh, Harmonization of insolvency laws is important, so there's still work outstanding to further further strengthen it. I think that should be the that should be the the, 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 the focus. Thank you. All right. Um, so maybe Tom has a reaction because I think your 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 general proposal also puts some trust into uh, the resolution framework, but it also says okay, we need to be prepared to do a little more than simply apply the existing rules. So Tom, maybe you just want to. Want to highlight a little bit your position. Thank you very much. I agree very strongly with the remarks that we need to pre prepare for the worst. Uh, the slide gives, uh, if you, I'll come back to that as the basis for the solution. Uh, but the, in in terms of the 
situation, the economic uh, conditions could get worse. Uh, the vaccines may not be completely effective. They may not roll out. Uh, so we could have a more severe economic environment than uh, is anticipated. Uh, in terms of the impact on the banks, uh, many, some could get driven to the point of non-viability. And the question is, uh, will the, they be able to be handled under the current regime? Bail-in works best uh, if it does not extend up the uh, creditor hierarchy to operating liabilities, such as derivatives and deposits. Uh, once it gets to the stage where those uh, liabilities have to be bailed in, uh, the uh, economic impacts of, of bail-in are mu much more severe, disruption to financial markets and the economy at large occurs. And for that reason, bail-in has, has to pass a public interest test. And it is doubtful, at least in my opinion, that bail-in would be employed if those operating liabilities were threatened with bail-in uh, because of the adverse consequences. If one wants to stop short of operating liabilities, as I believe one should, the question is, do, do uh, banks have enough obligations to investors to prevent that from happening? Uh, that is the purpose of the EMREL requirements that uh, Jan mentioned. Uh, the banks are making progress in that regard, but they have not yet completely fulfilled those obligations. And the question is, at least in my mind, that the authorities should consider is what happens if banks get to the point of non-viability uh, before the investor obligations in MREL are filled up uh, to the point where they one would not have to extend bail into operating liabilities. Um, the proposal is to uh, provide a, a, a means to uh, bring in uh, senior non-preferred debt uh, at this point in the uh, creditor hierarchy uh, in order to prevent the bail-in from moving to operating liabilities. So in the extreme case where the banks do get to the point of non-viability, one has a mechanism to bring in uh, backstop uh, from, the, uh, from a European backstop, effectively senior, non, senior most non-preferred debt that comes in on a last-in basis so that shareholders providers of AT1 capital, tier two capital, and senior non-preferred debt in the market are effectively wiped out before the public sector comes in. The point at which the public sector comes in and the terms on which it comes in depends critically at the point on the point at which the bank goes into resolution, whether forbearance is takes place uh, so that the, uh, if the bank is, goes into resolution at the point where it still has positive net worth, the situation is much easier to handle. And uh, I would submit that this type of solution gives an increased uh, confidence that the resolution process can start and can work in a, in a mechanism that in a, in a manner that will preserve financial stability. To, make, to provide the banks pay for it, I would suggest that the single resolution fund be able to effectively ask for a, pay a commitment fee to the uh, European backstop to make this type of uh, investment needed on an as it, on an as on, a, on, an, on an as needed basis, and that the order of uh, of uh, ex risk exposure. Uh, be shareholders first and creditors second, and that the operating liabilities, the depositors be protected. That's the gist of the proposal. Happy to answer any questions in the discussion. Thank you. Um, thanks. So this obviously 
um, put some some questions to both the supervisor and of course the resolution authority. Um, maybe maybe Kirsten, you go first. What do you what do you think of this? Thank you, Tobias. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very interesting uh, proposal, I would say. So, uh, I mean, it's, uh, but there are many details in it. So I will not go into details on it now, but I would like to, I mean, uh, really uh, agree on what has been said that there, there is a need to, to continue to build on the banking union. And I think this crisis has really shown that there has been, a, we have had good use of uh, having uh, the uh, um, the authorities in place, the SSM, the single resolution board, uh, to have a backstop in place would also be a very good contribution, and uh, also the, uh, the European deposit insurance scheme. So I think it's very important to not uh, forget that uh, to have have those uh, institutions in place in this crisis has been, uh, I must say, the uh, the steps that were taken in the springtime and the coordination between authorities, I think it was really exceptional. So we we have to keep the, that in mind. Then I'm sure that we can also improve the system. And when it comes to the crisis management issues, this is, of course, something that we are discussing regularly with the single resolution board and we are trying really to make sure that we can uh, coordinate as much as possible exchange information and make sure that we can manage uh, a crisis situation with both one and several banks and uh, i mean there is also an issue that has been mentioned on the insolvency um, legislation because that one is still uh, uh, national so um, uh, if uh, an institution is will not uh, be assessed as a in, in the public interest, it will go for uh, insolvency procedures in, on a national basis. And it, this is not harmonized. So I think this is an issue that we would also very much like to see uh, more harmonization. Uh, then the, the toolbox, I mean, what kind of tools do we need? And uh, Rolf already mentioned that the chair of the SSM has uh, advocated that we should have an asset management company, a European one or a network work of, um, of uh, asset management companies. I think that's a very good idea that we also have to explore further. Um, and I mean, we shall not... Uh, forget that traditional workout uh, uh, arrangements that banks can do on their own has also to be uh, explored further in order to make sure that we have a, a broad toolbox uh, and uh, we don't really want to use taxpayers' money. I think that's the whole idea with the setup and the new structure. So we will be happy also to continue the discussion on the paper that uh, um, Thomas Vatas has provided us with here. Thank you. It's, it's always very good if we uh, can foster discussion and exchange. So that's, that's something that's most welcome. And um, so in order to just uh, push this a little bit further, first of all, I think the, the attempts to harmonize insolvency laws, they were ongoing, coming more out of a different sphere, more from corporate corporate governance aspects, but still they're ongoing on the European level for 30 years. So I'm not 100% sure whether that will be achieved quickly. Um, and another aspect, that I, because I want to pick up a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A, um, which, you know, may be, they were addressed to me or to someone else, but they, they I think, fit nicely into Jan's uh, agenda. So one, one thing that, of course, uh, is critical if you want to rely on resolution is the resolvability of institutions. So the question is, uh, what's the take of the SRB currently on the resolvability of um, critical of large institutions? And then I think Kirsten rightly mentioned, of course, and also some, some commentators um, in the, in the Q&A also mentioned that well, it's the nature of banking union that some, uh, some, some economies will simply not have banking systems anymore, not least, uh, at least not of the size that they currently observe. However, that requires indeed a integration of the European banking market. And 
you know, you can be skeptical about that because fragmentation, I think, um, post uh, 2012 is still quite significant. And therefore, uh, the prospects of uh, mutual trust in, uh, you know, seeing your economy provided with funds uh, from outside your own uh, jurisdiction is essentially something that uh, at least at least some, some uh, Central European countries might actually not be willing to do, given the experience that they had. But uh, maybe, maybe Jan, you can react a little bit to both what Tom said and the two comments that I made from uh, picking up some points that were made in the audience. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, uh, Tobias, uh, more than happy to do so, I would say, because indeed, you know, Tom mentioned an interesting aspect and, and it's, it basically refers back to, to my introductionary remarks, you know, that, that keep on building Embryo is, is key. And that is one of our main focuses, but there's a bit more than that. And that is indeed exactly like the, 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 the question put on the table. It's, it's, it's resolution planning is of course a, a key aspect. And, and, um, and, and therefore the focus of the SRB is of course to continue working on making those plans executable. So a lot of work has already been done. A lot of progress has been made. But this is definitely something that is that is key. So continue to build on to build up Embro, but also to to focus on making resolution plans fully uh, executable. And one of the things that we are currently doing, and, and one of our main points of focus, is to also further operationalize uh, our toolkit, and then mainly the the transfer tool that we that we have as one of the tools in resolution. And um, I think it's it's a highly important uh, tool. And and the better we are prepared, the better we can also can also apply it. But I, I fully agree with, with Kirsten, let's not don't lose the, the focus on indeed making progress on, on, the, various, uh, on the various aspects. Um, this is really a very good momentum to move forward and further strengthen the banking union so that things come, come nicely together and that we try to also create this third lag so that, uh, that everything is in place uh, in case it is, it, is, uh, it is needed. And I fully agree with Rolf, if I may, you know, an exp explanation of the backstop and the importance of getting the backstop in place, uh, I could not agree agree more. Thank you. So, Rolf, any any comments on on let, or, let or me, anything that, that pops up in the Q and A? So, let me address some points that you raised. Uh, you mentioned the question on uh, of insolvency laws, and that this is a difficult process. And I, one can only agree that it is a difficult process also because insolvency laws are deeply enshrined in national law. One of the possible solutions or one of the avenues to take is obviously not to try to rewrite the insolvency law for the entire corporate sector, but focus on the banks. And that, that is a, then maybe a more practical proposition that one can address more easily in trying to achieve some harmonization uh, for this specific area. And that I uh, we feel is worth uh, some some thought. You there was the question on the on the banking sector and do you need a banking sector in, in a way um, that a little bit reminded me of the 2015 period where we basically had the risk of a melting down Greek banking sector, which would have meant uh, the exit of Greece from monetary union. Right, that's very clear. So the question can is and as you framed it. Do we need to need to have domestic banks, or can banking sectors shrink? And I think next to what um, Jan said about um, not making the taxpayers pay, I think part of this entire proposition of banking union is as well that there can be failing banks without having the risk that this becomes fully systemic, right? So, can could the banking sectors could banking sectors be modified as a consequence of the of the crisis? Yes. It could happen, uh, and we see also already now ongoing consolidations in Italy, for example, where there are mergers and um, uh, merger talks ongoing. Now, uh, but you also alluded to the point of home host um, <clears throat> as being one of the key issues here, and, and again, I can fully agree. It, it is a, a very prevailing issue, and it takes a lot of trust building. But here, I think it also kicks in what, what we mentioned before, thinking about the resolution framework and thinking about resolution management. And probably you cannot build up trust from today to tomorrow. Um, so, and there are different elements in building trust. 
giving trust in the resolution framework the way it works under the current legislation is certainly an important element where we probably can still advance more, but I think also Jan and, and, and Kirsten can, can talk on that. The other question that is being discussed then in the context of banking union, what are the different elements, how they fit together? And for me, it is very important that this banking union project is taken from a holistic perspective. And if you put things together holistically, then you can find solution. If you have EDIS, host countries can feel much safer. So when you have EDIS you, and host countries feel much safer, you can also think more about creating waivers for liquidity requirements and, and capital requirements. And that means you can move to a more integrated banking sector. I think it's this kind of interaction that we need to explore forward looking uh, in order to, to overcome those elements. Thank you. Right, so I think that that's, um, that's something that probably most people would agree that the backstop, whatever form it takes is a critical element because indeed, uh, the rest, uh, more or less, is just uh, there for incentive alignment. But the backstop is really what, what uh, makes this uh, integration work. Um, so therefore, yeah, uh, that's something that, that's important. But let me just return to uh, this idea of uh, solving the current crisis in resolution, because that's something that uh, I think you, you all like very much. Um, the, the problem with that is that if it's really a systemic crisis, and there are indicators that it indeed is, um, then, of course, the reliance on bail-in has potentially destabilizing function. And then, of course, something that, that Tom just showed us, the, the, uh, uh, the balance sheet of a bank, of course, matters a lot because there uh, it matters how some of the chunks, some of the building blocks of the balance sheet are actually structured uh, in terms of maturity. So if it's really short-term stuff, and a lot of banks actually do have a lot of short-term liabilities um, that, that are, you know, under at least the current framework subject to bail-in. Um, so, so if that is really the case, then uh, really running around without having a backstop uh, that's fully operational and telling everybody, oh yeah, we're gonna bail you all in uh, given the losses that are of systemic proportion might actually be destabilizing. I just put that up a little bit provocatively, but, um, it's well known, and, and I don't know if, if anybody, so it very much depends on the scenario that we have, that we're facing, but at least it's at least a uh, potential risk that's inherent in the, this whole concept of private sector involvement in reorganizing the banking sector, particularly in systemic crises. I don't know if uh, any of you has a reaction to that. Maybe, maybe what if you go first, uh, because you're, you also have- I mean, on, on, the back, on, on the backstop, um, again. So this is to cover the, in my view, uh, to cover tail risks, right? So in exceptional circumstances where the means of the SRF would not be sufficient. And we, it's also clear that the single resolution fund is currently being filled up with contributions. And, and um, th uh, there is a significant amount of money available um, already. So nonetheless, for those tail risks, it's, a, it's important to have it. And we all say, yes, let's go ahead. We, we would wish that policymakers go ahead and indeed decide soon to basically put it in place. And, um, and that will be helping. I mean, you, you make the point about systemic risks. And again, it's not for me I'm, to, to kind of answer that, that this is also uh, because it's a supervisory question. But in terms of infrastructure, it's also clear. So we have a but much better view overall where the banking sector is. I mean, we referred before to the stress test exercise that was done in July. We know that another stress test exercise is planned for next July. Um, so there is ongoing supervision. There are systematic points on which also policymakers can rely in then taking decisions of what are the adequate measures and, and how one can react to this crisis. So I think overall, from that perspective, while there are risks, at least so far on our side, on, on our, I, I do not uh, sense that we would be kind of straight moving into a systemic crisis, banking crisis here. If it were to materialize, I agree with you, then of course 
we would have to very carefully think what are the adequate means of addressing it, because then that's a very severe situation. Um, Kerstin, uh, you want to react to this? Yes, thank you, Tobias. Yeah, I agree very much with uh, Rolf's view. I mean, uh, uh, we ha have, as I said, I think the pan-European structure for regulation and supervision uh, has worked uh, very well. And the uh, establishment of the single resolution board has also worked well. And we are building capacity to be able to uh, manage also banks with problems. And as I mentioned, uh, we made this vulnerability analysis in the summer period and we published the result in September. And I mean, our view is that banks uh, will be able to cope with the, uh, uh, the uh, losses or the uh, non-performing loans that they will see here for the uh, coming year. Having said that, I mean, the, the uncertainty is of course here and uh, we as supervisor, we have a very strong focus now, now on the discussions with banks to make sure that they are, I mean, not waiting for the moratorias and governmental, governmental guarantees to expire, but that they are proactively uh, going into discussions with their customers, making sure that they have a good, uh, I mean, uh, assessment of each customer and the credit risk and the potential losses for the future. And I mean, also, just to, uh, to, to go back and say that the, the banks uh, this time, they are uh, better capitalized and both with capital and but also the liquidity buffers and they're much better uh, uh, now shaped to, uh, to deal with the crisis that, than they were at the great financial crisis in 2008 and nine. So, uh, of course, there are always uncertainties and we are in a crisis mood, but uh, still our uh, assessment is that banks will be able to cope with the uh, present crisis and the losses that it will deliver. Okay, let me, let me come back to this point uh, a little bit later, but I see that Tom has uh, some, some remarks. So, Tom, go ahead. Could I, could I suggest the importance of looking at forbearance uh, and the role of the central bank in making the transition from supervision to resolution? Uh, in, if the central bank, if the forbearance is executed and the bank operates with negative net worth, that, that certainly complicates the, the problem for the resolution authority. In contrast, if the bank enters resolution at a point where it is below minimum requirements, but still has positive net worth, the position of the tier two capital provider is much better. And indeed uh, the tier two capital provider should wind up with the equity in the institution and be able to uh, actually uh, have some positive value in the situation. So the, the role of uh, forbearance also, in my opinion, needs uh, uh, consideration in the t uh, looking at the total picture. Kirsten, um, that's more or less directed to you as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are, I mean, we have just had uh, one crisis uh, case, or the SRB has had one case to deal with. So, uh, I um, mean, we, we need, of course, to develop the uh, cooperation between us. And uh, uh, there are probably, I mean, different or several areas in the crisis management process that can be improved and where we can uh, cooperate and coordinate uh, better with the um, single resolution board. But uh, I mean, what I would like to say is that the overall structure is in place, uh, but uh, then, I mean, as was also mentioned here with the, uh, with the uh, banking sector and that we, I mean, still don't really have a, a true European banking sector. And that is also something that we need to uh, uh, continue working upon. Uh, it is still fragmented. And I mean, as was said here earlier, I mean, 
banks in some countries will be more hit by this crisis than banks in other countries and the same with sectors in different sectors in in Europe so it's always hard to say that this is one size fits all it's we have to adjust supervision and resolution to the banks we have under our supervision I, I agree that uh, certain uh, adjustments need to be made, but uh, in terms of the discussion, there's a, a great importance placed upon gone concern uh, capital, uh, gone concern loss absorbing capacity, and attention uh, to what the investor is going to get in return for providing such capital also should have a role in the discussion. If it's simply there to absorb the loss, uh, then the, the the risk of that is effectively uh, equivalent to a write down bond. If there's no pro no possibility that the tier two provider actually uh, takes over a viable institution, uh, then it's a very different framework. And the 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 point at which the authorities enter, intervene whether there is or is not for forbearance plays a, a role in that consideration. So that, I think that's, that's an important point, but uh, one thing that I wanted to return to is um, the statement that also Kirsten made that uh, the European banking system is better capitalized. Uh, one uh, reason a little bit looming in the back when we wrote our paper essentially was that uh, one of my co-authors, Sasha Steffen, um, has a very insightful paper jointly with uh, Viral Acharya that presents empirical evidence that um, the significantly lower growth levels that we saw in Europe during the last decade, so the decade post the global financial crisis, are due to an uh, undercapitalized banking system. So even though we're better off, it's obvious that others um, are even still better off. Right? So the U.S., which had a massive recapitalization of its banking system with taxpayer money up front, and also a couple of banks, of course, exiting the market, but still um, it did something in a systemic crisis. And therefore, let me press you a little bit on that um, and ask you, so do you really think that not only uh, is the banking system adequately capitalized to withstand the crisis and the losses that uh, are impending, but also to finance the recovery, right? So the dynamic uh, recovery that we hope, uh, that we all hope to see. So, uh, yes, that's a good question. Thank you. I mean, uh, I think I mentioned that. I mean, it's not just the present crisis, but it's also what comes out after the medium term perspective for the banking sector. So, I mean, my view is that banks are better off now be with more capital and more liquidity than I at the uh, crisis 2008. But of course you are right that they are not, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, uh, they are not as prof profitable as banks are in many other parts of the world. And uh, there is, I guess, uh, over capacity of banks in Europe. So, uh, what banks need to be working on for the future is also their business models because they must ensure that they have a viable business uh, model for the future and uh, that includes of course making enough profit but also having enough capacity to invest in um, the digitalization. I mean the uh, crisis now shows also that bank customers say uh, uh, are going more and more digital. And uh, I think that is something that is here to stay. The uh, banking will not go back to the uh, normal before the crisis. There will be a, a new normal for banks uh, for the future. So there are many challenges for banks ahead. It's not just dealing with the present crisis, but also prepare for the future. Rolf, any, any thoughts on, on that? I, I perfectly agree with that. I mean, what you, what is the question behind it, right, is also the question, what is, if you want banks to be capitalized up front in order to be able to finance a recovery, is that efficient use of public money? Um, or what are the inherent forces that Kirsten 
refer to of the banking sector to actually make an effort and improve the situation. So I think in that regard, um, the, the, the European approach of trying to, or should be and is to create an environment and that is what the effort should concentrate on to create an environment where banks can be profitable and have this capital generation, generating capacity in order to serve um, for the recovery. On top of what, as we said before, governments are already doing in supporting them, right? So again, the guarantees are, the guarantees are in place and the guarantees are giving ex actually support to the economy that works via the banking system. And this can, in a very limited or in a very specific way, all still continue. I mean, at the European level, if you uh, go that route, the EIB scheme has, put, it has been put in place in order to make also to extend uh, financing to companies via, via banks. Uh, so there is, there is help being provided, but I think it cannot be the main approach in solving, in, in uh, financing the recovery. Here we also, I think, need to put a broader picture and let me just simply briefly mention capital market union. I think the capital requirements for the recovery are huge. I mean, this will should be the decade of investment that we, we will be seeing now. And not all of that can be pure bank finance. So I think it is indeed crucially important that we strengthen financing also for small caps, medium caps in, in the economy uh, beyond the banking system. And we find other financing instruments than simply bank loans and more equity type financing uh, schemes here. So, and that should also be a huge effort and should be a focus as we go in order to have a, a forceful recovery. Very well, one, one aspect that also popped up both in Tom's and one of the remarks that I saw in the Q&A. Um, so the SRB can also be an important player in essentially preventing forbearance. So um, you have the power essentially to uh, pull the plug, even though the central bank, so the supervisor might be reluctant to do so. Um, how do you see this capacity? I mean, do you, do you really think along the lines that Tom has, hint, has hinted at, or do you see more your role as being in a, in a you know, dialogue with the central bank, or how do you see that with supervisors? No, thank you. Thank you. This, this is indeed an important element, and building upon what Tom basically said, no, I, th I think the timing uh, for resolution to kick in is, is, of course, a very important one. So it should not be too early. It should definitely also not be too, too late. And I think, first of all, this, this requires uh, a very good cooperation between the resolution authority and, and the supervisory authority. And, and like Kirsten said, there is excellent cooperation. So I think that's very important. But the system also indeed has certain checks and balances there, which I think is, is one of the elements that really makes a difference compared to, um, to, to, to the old framework, that, that we are in a completely different situation. But I think what is, what is important, like, like Kirsten said, you know, we, it's not only this that has changed, not only the regulatory environment has changed completely, but also we're talking about banks that are in a, in a different shape than, than what we have seen in, in, in the past. And, um, and I, I just wanted to refer also to what, what Rolf said. I think what I very much liked, if I, if I may, is how he explained this holistic approach you know, where we say, okay, things are very much interlinked and deepening this banking union is, is one of the, 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 the essential things to try to, to further enhance the system. But, but we also have to, to keep in mind that a lot has already been achieved. And, and you were, we're referring to, to one thing, but I think it's very important uh, to, to keep in mind, you know, that, 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 that the situation is totally not comparable with, with what we have seen in 2008. And, and, and that is, is definitely something that, uh, that, that gives reassurance to the situation that we face. So again, you know, I think on, on, in terms of timing of resolution, yes, it's an important element. Close cooperation is important, but indeed there are also certain checks and balances to make sure that um, that resolution uh, uh, kicks in at the right moment. Thank you. Um, one, one, maybe one final point from my side. Um, you frequently mentioned that uh, in order to return to a profitable um, and, and um, efficient banking sector, we need some consolidation. 
Uh, let me pick your brains on whether that's a good moment uh, for consolidation or what do you expect as an outcome of the crisis? Uh, consolidation in the sense that we get stronger banks, of course. Uh, maybe one of you go first because it's, it's a little bit something. I, on that side, I can basically only reiterate what I, what I mentioned before in a sense that um, we note that there is a certain degree of overcapacity in some banking sectors in, in Europe. Um, that per se may call already for some consolidation and we are seeing actually consolidation. A crisis can be an accelerator in this regard. Um, so from that perspective, we set up the system in order to also make, make that possible. Um, from that perspective, I, I do see scope for it. The question is, what is the form that it takes and whether it remains mainly or purely national or whether it can be cross-border? And, and here simply the point is, I do agree that it does, from asking for cross-border consolidation um, in a way should help to maximize, so to speak, the opportunities. But in any case, there has to be a business case for doing it. Uh, in the first place, which means that indeed there should be, there is a need to create this profitable working environment um, that exists across the Euro area. So here's again where, where it comes together, creating the necessary market condition for the single market and then allowing for consolidation to happen across borders. Um, that is the way forward. All right, thanks. Um, Kerstin, anything to add to that or? Uh, thank you, uh, Tobias. No, I agree very much. And from a supervisory point of view, we are not pushing consolidation, but we are saying that this consolidation may be uh, one way of dealing with the uh, overcapacity and making banks more profitable. But uh, exactly as um, Rolf was saying, it's important that the uh, Emerge Bank also has a sustainable business model and that they can uh, work more efficiently in a merged uh, way. In order to facilitate for, I mean, making sure that the market understands the supervisory approach, we have issued a draft uh, guideline on the supervisory view upon consolidation and uh, we will soon uh, uh, publish also the uh, final version just to make sure that, I mean, there are no rumors that the uh, supervisor stands in the way of consolidation, because if there is a good consolidation, we will promote that as well. Thank you. Tom, you have some remarks? Uh, first, to agree very strongly that there has been enormous progress made with respect to the banks, both in terms of the strength of the banks themselves and the sy systemic architecture. And what we've been talking about today is additional improvements that uh, might, should be put in place to prepare for the worst. Uh, on, that, on that point, perhaps I come back to uh, Ralph's comments about the use of the backstop. And uh, is, is, does he envisage that there would be access to the ESM without a requirement for the member state to go through a, a, a restructuring program? Maybe I indeed can answer that question very uh, immediately, and it's very important to understand. Uh, what is very important to understand is that our function as a common backstop is not linked to a member state. This is a direct relationship between, so to speak, the single resolution board and the ESM, where we would basically provide means to the single resolution fund. That has to be approved by the board of directors. And it's very clear also that we don't want to reconsider the resolution decision or anything of that. It's just providing the means. But here we deviate from the other framework that we have for our work, which is linked to sovereign requests. And sovereign requests, so it's a categorically different instrument that, that we are coming up here in order to contribute to that structure. On the sovereign side, it is also well known that we have adjusted our toolbox in order to address the current crisis. And we have created on the back of a credit line that we have a pandemic support facility where member states 
can ask for support, but that is support to the sovereign in order to finance healthcare expenditures. Thank you. Uh, this is a um, very interesting aspect that we finally touched upon. So I think our time is already up. So um, I have to thank you very much and wholeheartedly for this very candid exchange. And I hope that you and also the participants found that fruitful. I learned a lot. I, I'm very happy that this is possible despite the circumstances. So that's a very good prospect. Uh, but uh, still, I hope to see you all again uh, next year, hopefully properly vaccinated and physically again. So thanks a lot for, for joining us. Also, uh, thanks for Tom for co-organizing that. Tom, your famous last words. Thank you very much for this discussion. Look forward to continuing it and uh, hope that these uh, uh, emergency measures we've discussed today don't become necessary. All right, great. Thanks. You will stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, bye.